My name is Karen Hill. This is the Oral History of Social Work in Canada project, a project of the Canadian Association of Social Workers. Today is the 5th of May, 1984, and I'm in Regina. Uh, today I'm interviewing Ms. Mildred E. Battle, who's had long experience in child welfare in Saskatchewan. Ms. Battle, in order to begin, I wonder if you might tell us when and where you were born and a little bit about your background. Well, I was born in uh, a little town just west of Moose Jaw, Karen, Saskatchewan. Do you want to know when? <laughs> if you'd like to tell us, yes, indeed. In 1908. Uh -huh. um, my father and mother both were pioneers. And uh, my grandfather came to the prairie in 85 and my father in 92. So, that, you know, I had a real prairie background. Um, after I finished collegiate, I uh, went to normal school for four months and then went teaching. I was 17 at the time. Mm -hmm. And I taught for a couple of years and then I went to the University of Manitoba and when I came out uh, after that year, it was fairly obvious I couldn't go on to university because it was the beginning of bad times. And. Um, so I went back teaching, and I taught for a year in high school. I went to the university another year and came back and got really my university education uh, pretty piecemeal and finished it uh, extramurally. Mm -hmm. uh, I taught school, high school, and then <clears throat> I always laugh about this because of women's lib, you know. I, I left the profession because uh, they paid a man junior to me who was a really dreadful teacher um, more money than they did me. And I had taught in that district for five years when they pulled this one. So I thought, well, I think I'll quit for the time being. And I went and worked for the provincial government in uh, the taxation department. Now, it would seem as if it were a waste of time, but looking back, I learned a great deal in that department, which came in very, it was very important to me later, because I learned a fair amount about administration, which is often left out of social work. Mm -hmm. And I knew a debit from a credit, you know. It was this sort of thing, I think, that was very helpful. Uh, because that happened to be a department that was very well run. And, and uh, However, the war came and uh, I couldn't uh, go into the forces um, because of physical condition I had. And um, I went to Ottawa and worked for a year for the Department of Munitions and Supply. And, after I'd been in that department, I wondered how we ever won the war. It was the most ridiculous setup I ever saw. <laughs> the uh, man who was head of the section I was in, uh, he was a scholar, you know, he was a statistician. And uh, he just didn't know anything about running the office. Well, I decided that really if that was my war effort, they could, would win it without me because, uh, and it was then that I decided to think about going to uh, social work. And I did this because a friend, a very good friend of mine was a social worker. Who was that, Miss Battle? Her name was Marion Duncan. Her, uh, she later became Marion Racine, mm -hmm. and she lives in Brampton. Um, and she graduated about the same time as Marie Parr did from uh, the School of Social Work in Montreal. And <laughs> So I wrote, to, you know, to uh, Toronto and, and Montreal for their syllabus and so on, and uh, they sent them. But that wasn't uh, what ha really the end of the story, then, because Montreal kept pushing me. And eventually I got uh, a notice that Dorothy King, who was the head of the school, uh, was coming to Ottawa and she would like to see me. 
and she met me in what used to be Peacock Alley, which was a tea room along the side, and we had tea together. While she talked to me, I didn't realize this was my intake interview. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it was... Uh, so at the end of this, Dorothy said to me, well, when are you coming to the school? And I said, I can't, I can't afford it. So she said, well, and she had a habit of pulling her ear all the time, and she pulled her ear, and she said, if we could get you some money, would you come? And uh, the scholarships and that kind of thing were, were not known in those days, um, or very little, uh, there was no help, really. But there was one uh, $500 bursary in the School of Social Work. And she got it for me. I still didn't have enough money, so. But I went to to the school anyway, and um, worked uh, as a, a, I suppose, a foster parent, you'd call it, in uh, the children's home there. And the person who was in charge of that was Florence Philpott, mm -hmm. <laughs> who I'm sure you will be interviewed. And we worked at night and weekends and so on. And I stayed there until I cracked up uh, physically doing these two things. I shouldn't say I cracked up because I, it wasn't a mental thing at all, it was physical. And for the last four months I was there, I had to, um, I couldn't uh, carry on there, so I had to leave. But I finished my degree. Mm -hmm. Could we talk for a minute about your term at McGill? <clears throat> um, you, uh, you, do you have a recollection about the courses that you had when you were at McGill? Yes, I do. Um, the, the, they taught casework in those days, <laughs> you know, the real thing. And the person who taught us at casework was a woman named Alice Taylor who was very well known in the United States later. She, she and another worker wrote one of the famous reports for the federal government down there. And she was a remarkable woman. She, if you went through her class and didn't know how to do casework, there was something wrong with you, you know. The other thing, of course, was we were a very small class, you know. How many were there? I think we started out about 10 and ended with about six. This was during the war, so oh, yes. a lot of changes yes. were taking place. Yes, this was in, um, yeah, during the war. Mm -hmm. And um, I took that class. The other one I remember very, very well was that we were fortunate enough to have cut. You want to stop for a minute? Uh, um, so he was, taught us social welfare. Frank Scott, Dean taught Blois, us taught social, social welfare. And um, he, uh, you know, discussed prisons and, well, he, the, the gamut of social welfare at that time. And he was a tall, he is a tall, lanky kind of a man. And we sat around a table and Frank Scott sat in a chair and I always was afraid he'd fall over. And with one foot up, you know, against the table, and he kind of teetered there and lectured. <laughs> we were very lucky to have uh, to have those kind of people. May I ask you a question about that class? Uh, yeah. Given that, that it was Frank Scott, uh, hadn't he been involved uh, in the League for Social Reconstruction and social planning for Canada and all that sort of thing in the 30s? I I couldn't tell you that. I knew that he was chairman of the. Uh, of the NDP or the CCF at that time it was. So were those kinds of ideas, uh, oh. socialist-leaning kinds of ideas coming through in his teaching? Well, the fact that, that you had to have some kind of government planning for people, yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you lived in Montreal during that period, you would see why he said this. Why so? Well, uh, public assistance was given out by the churches and the parishes. And it was quite, you know, it was really um, mm 
quite dreadful. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Did you think that his ideas applied to Saskatchewan, where you'd come from? Well, I really didn't think much about him, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, uh, Saskatchewan was made up of people who were, who were pretty um, self-sufficient, shall I put it that way? But I had lived through the Depression in Saskatchewan and saw what it did and, and was a bit horrified by watching the trains go through and all those men sitting on them, boxcars, and being pushed from Regina to Calgary and, you know, they, they just went across the country. Mm -hmm. I, I think that kind of thing uh, bothered me, but that wasn't why I went into social work. I, I really don't know why I did it. You know, isn't that fun? Yeah. Uh, it was just hearing people, my friends, talk yeah. about it. I, I don't think it was any great commitment at the time. Mm -hmm. if, uh, you know, mm -hmm. I, I think a lot of social workers would say that. You're right. Um, given your later work in administration, I wonder if you had any classes in administration when you were at the School of Social Work. Now that I cannot remember. Mm -hmm. Dorothy King taught I guess it was called Community Org, but she spent a good deal of her time talking about relations with with the community and uh, how important it was to work with, with the community. She was the first person who started the Edmonton Bureau of Family Welfare, mm -hmm. the Family Welfare Bureau I in Edmonton. And um, she she was such a a wonderful person that I think anybody who went through the school when Dorothy was the head of it picked up this feeling. Um, but I think that that this is where I would be sure I I received the the feeling that you had to work with other agencies and people and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. During the time you were at McGill, you were working uh, at Summerhill House. Did you also do a field placement? Oh, yes. Yes. Where were I did the first field placement with a, a woman who had a, a, a... Again, you see, it's the people you met at the time that had the influence on her. Her name was Janet Long. And she... Uh, I, I can't remember the name of it. It was a girls' school for delinquents, and it was... Out at um, in the eastern townships there somewhere, and the role of the agency in Montreal was to look after the girls after they came out of the school, like work placements and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But she was such a character that you just. You could learn so much from a woman like this, and in dedication, and and how to to act. She was terribly angry with me once. I went down to one of the girls that picked been picked up by the police, and she phoned me. It was about eight thirty at night, and she was in jail. And she said, "Now you get me out of jail. I didn't do anything." And of course, wouldn't you know? I couldn't get hold of Janet. And I couldn't get hold of anybody from the school. I tried and to find out what to do. And this is how you find out what to do. Uh, you have nobody around to tell you. <laughs> and uh, so I got on the streetcar and I went down to Bon Secours and um, got my little girl out of jail. Well, I phoned the magistrate in, in between. Mm -hmm. And he had phoned the jail for me, too. And I took her um, home, and I got Dorothy King about 12.30 that night. And she told me to be at court the next morning. And, I forgot, and, and she, she picked me up, and we went to court, and she had a lawyer and so on. And she was very angry for me that I had not taken a taxi, of all things, to go down to that jail, which was in the slums of Montreal, you know. 
She thought you should take better care of yourself, huh? Well, yes. She, yes. She was really quite annoyed by that one. But, <laughs> you know, these are the things you do when you're learning, I suppose. Sure, sure. I didn't realize that. I just knew that girl had to be taken out of that jail. Mm hmm Yeah. Did you do another field placement, too? Yes. I did one with the Family Welfare Bureau. In Montreal? Mm-hmm. Or is that what they called it? Yeah. I'm not sure. Family services. Well, anyway, a family agency. And that gave me, I'll tell you, a funny feeling Why? about about people because I had a caseload that I was supposed to do casework with, but most of them were starving. And I asked, I, got, I almost failed social work on because this person was so angry with me, the head of the agency, whose name I won't mention. Because I said I felt it was pretty futile to do casework with people to get them to enjoy being hungry or to, uh, uh, you know, to work with them when you couldn't give them the basic necessities of living. Mm -hmm. I remember one family that was down in the East End. Oh, God. And oh. she had a she had a, a, a baby and, you know, just to get medical care for a person like that was, was dreadful. Mm -hmm. How did the uh, supervisor at the agency respond when you said you... Well, if she took the attitude that I, I wasn't going along with agency policy, that, you know, actually they were doing casework. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, I couldn't reconcile the two. Mm -hmm. um, at that time, which would have been 1944 and 1945, I guess, it would have, you were in, at, at McGill from 43 to 45, were mm -hmm. you? Were you at all involved with the professional association that existed at the time? Yes, I went to a couple of meetings of them in Montreal, but this was the thing that I felt is terribly important, and I said this, I've said this to directors of the schools. I. Uh, this one in, one in Manitoba with which I was attached, that the schools, it seems to me, should talk more about the profession. Mm -hmm. The profession. Um, because I, I think an interesting thing has happened here in Saskatchewan right now, and that is that I see names on the lists of people who have joined SASW that sure weren't there a couple of years ago, but they're believing that solidarity means something right now. You know, they have to stand shoulder to shoulder. Mm -hmm. But I, I felt that Dorothy, this was one thing that Dorothy King taught me, was the value of the profession itself. Mm -hmm. So that the first question I asked when I came to Regina was, Keith, where is where, when does the uh, SASW meet? He said, there isn't anybody. And actually, Marie was in on this, of course, and she may have told you about it, but the we, first which, meeting... Which Marie? Marie Parr. Uh, the first, uh, because she was there the first time we had a meeting to get together to see if we could get ten people who were professionals. Mm -hmm. Did you? Yes, by getting a man from the army who was going to lose his, you know, the uniform was going to disappear. But he, while he was here, he signed the little. <laughs> yeah. And that was how SASW got a, got its beginnings. Huh? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm, I'm skipping back and forth here. But um, you see, I I really feel, and if there's any way people can do this, uh, I think that. The, uh, to know that the person you're working with is a professional, you take certain things for granted, don't you? For instance, when I, when I was working with the Family Welfare Bureau here, I took it for granted that what I said to Marjorie, that she would she would treat this in a professional way, mm -hmm. you know. And this is where I think it's important. Mm -hmm. 
that you trust the people you, I don't mean just staff, I, I mean other people in the profession. And I think we're, like my students told me, I did field work placements, you know, supervised field work placement. And my students told me that I was the only person they'd ever heard mention CSW hmm. at the school. Yeah. That's not good, you know, mm -hmm. is it? No, 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 it's a mm. shame because the schools have such an important role. Hmm. Um, so when you finished your time at McGill, um, what did you do then? Huh. Well, this was interesting. Social workers were very much in demand at that time. You could have got one of ten jobs as easy as that, you know. But I had had a letter from Keith Armstrong in Saskatchewan uh, saying that he had come to the department and he needed staff and so on. And talking over these with uh, Dorothy King, she said, well, there's no question, you're going to home. I said, I don't think I know enough, and I, I should stay here where I can refine my practice. Of that. She said, fiddlesticks, he doesn't need you in five years, he needs you now. So I went home, she sent me. <laughs> and you were not a child at that, at that time either, were you? No. So when you came back to Saskatchewan in what, 1945 or so? Mm -hmm. What was March your first, 1945. What was your first job? Well, I was in the office for about 10 days where I was looked at, you know, quite askance. For instance, a, a, super, a person who'd been in that agency for 30 years came up to me and said, uh, Miss Battle, we have a girl here that's been running away all the time. What would you do? They knew I was a trained social worker. Sure. And I was the only one in the department outside of Keith. You know? Right. So uh, Keith played it down. I played it down that uh, I had training, you know, uh, because until they got to know you, this was quite a, you know, it was difficult. When you came into, as I remember, the department had been formed in 1944, and Keith, Keith Armstrong was the first head. I was there six months later. Six months later. Who were the other staff, um, and how many were there? Well, the other staff were people who had worked for the um, Bureau of Child Protection. Mm -hmm. And some of these people were highly, uh, were extremely good practitioners, like Alice Dales, who headed our adoption division. Uh, she didn't have a degree, but my gracious, she had years of experience. And she had done a lot of work uh, with, because even before this happened, the head of the Bureau, had found out that social work was important. And so these people, Alice had gone to a couple of, of uh, sessions. Mm -hmm. yeah. But then there were other people. Um, and these were, as I say, people who had worked for the Bureau of Child Protection. Mm -hmm. um, and Keith had come in as a worker a year before he became director. Mm -hmm. He had a terrible time. The superintendent of child welfare at that time was a lawyer, and um, he and Keith just didn't see each other. And so Keith traveled the province a lot that during that period, that year, which stood him in pretty good stead when he became head of the branch. You know, he knew, he knew the province. Um, he visited every institution, for instance, things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. So 
when I came in, he, he was so terribly busy, you know, he couldn't really talk to me much about the department, but I met the deputy, I met Jack White, and uh, then after reading files for 10 days, he said, I'm sending you to Moose to start the Moose Jaw office up there. And he said, there's a car out behind the building, here are the keys. And I had told Keith three times I didn't drive. <laughs> you know. So I thought, this man's mad or something. But I phoned my cousin in Moose Jaw, and he came down on the bus and got me and took the car. <laughs> we took the car and we got to the four mile corner out here and Jack said, okay, I'll let you drive. And uh, I never did learn to drive, actually, you know. I, he told me that if I drove at 25 miles an hour and uh, I could always hit the brakes. <laughs> so for mi miles and miles in Saskatchewan, I drove at 25 miles an hour <laughs> because nobody taught me how. <laughs> it was <laughs> terrible. When I think of it, you know, it just makes me crawl. <laughs> when when uh, you had gotten your instructions to start the Moose Jaw office, did you get more more instruction than that? Here's the keys to the car? No. Uh, they, Moose Jaw had a children's aid society at that time, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> it, it's, I'm not looking down at this particularly at this man, but the secretary of the Moose Jaw Children's Aid Society had been my uncle's hired man, and he had absolutely no education. I knew him because he had worked for my uncle. And he, his work in Moose Jaw consisted of going around to the pool halls to make sure kids weren't there and that kind of thing. And when he did have to go to the hospital to take a child into care, it was just dreadful. So I, I went to Moose Jaw. I wasn't quite sure what I was supposed to do, but anyway, I, I soon, sure soon found out. Because the minute they knew I was in town, the police started to phone me. Um, the hospitals were practically held out their arms and said, here you are, you know, that kind of thing. What did they want of you? What did the... Well, for instance, if there was an unmarried mother in the hospital, what were you going to do with her baby if what she had... wanted to give it up? What had they done with the child before? Well, uh, the secretary of the children's aid had taken the child into care. But Besides that, in Wooshaw, there was a children's shelter. Mm -hmm. And Keith sure had his eye on it. And it had um, uh, a baby's nursery. It ran the full gamut of from a baby to 16. And this is impossible in an institution. So I just puddled along, you know, and I had lots of work to do. Did they know what? A, did those people in the hospitals and the police and the lawyers and such? Did they know what a social worker? Not, could not do? really. Uh, one of the uh, funny things I did then it was kind of funny. There was one doctor in Wuxia who had graduated fairly recently and who knew me very well because his father had been the minister at our church. So I knew Lloyd and. Um, he arranged a meeting, well, he didn't arrange the meeting, they were having a meeting, of the Moose Jaw Medical Society. And they were just at that time, the Council of Women were trying to set up a family, well, a family bureau in Moose Jaw. And I became quite confused with this because they thought I was that person who had come. And we had to get this straightened out. They finally put my name in the paper and a picture and so on, so that they know what I did, and that I wasn't that person. That person was later Jesse McPherson, mm -hmm. who was for years in the jail down random there. Well, anyway, Paris of Prairie, I should say. Um, they arranged this meeting with the doctors. <laughs> 
And uh, I was to tell them what a social worker did. And the kind of classes I took at university and every, you know, uh, it happened at the very time when Moose Jaw was being set up as a health region by the government. And the man who was the health doc, the doctor, you know, in charge of Moose Jaw Health was an elderly man. And when they threw this open for for uh, conversation, you know, the the council of Mushta had just authorized that they would pay one hundred and thirty-five dollars a month to the family bureau mm -hmm. if, when it, when and if it was set up. Yeah. Well, this made that doctor absolutely livid. No GD person was worth one hundred and thirty-five dollars a month. Mm -hmm. You know. Mm -hmm. Well, it got to be, the doctors on this side, one of them anyway, was very in, much in favor of social work. And it got to be a real argument about, <laughs> about this. And finally the chairman called, uh, called it and uh, had one of the doctors escort me upstairs where it was. The next morning I was at the Providence Hospital and I met a doctor in the hall and he said, don't you think it's ridiculous, Miss Battle, that you're paid $135 a month in a car? <laughs> <laughs> what did you say? It's not and me, it's not his me. His wife was a social worker. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> were you involved in the, uh, uh, or were you in Moose Jaw at the time that the uh, Children's Aid Society there closed? I sure was. Could you describe what happened and why the society went out of business? Well, the reason it went out of business was that Keith decided it was going to go out of business, I think. Uh, you know, and if you saw what they did in Moose Jaw at that time, you would understand why it was important. What was happening? Well, um, I've told you that who was working here. The most important thing in the Children's Aid Society in Moose Jaw was the shelter. Mm -hmm. And the shelter was an excellent building and it was scrupulously clean. I said that you could eat off the floor but I didn't know children ever wanted to. <laughs> and the boardroom was sitting there. It, it reminded me of uh, Summerhill House in in Montreal when Florence took it over first. There was a boardroom there that the door was locked where the board met, but which children could never go in to play or, and they played in the halls. Mm -hmm. You know, there was no room. The nursery had no nurse in it, uh, no professional person. And that was really, and they, you see, they had such a few staff that the toddlers weren't put out on the floor. They were just left in their cribs. Well, you know what happened to them. They all got big bellies and, uh, you know, they were, uh, they thought they were mentally retarded, mm -hmm. you know, these kids. And my, I had been sent up to em empty the shelter so that the emphasis I was put, that I had, was to find foster homes to put the children in. Mm -hmm. And I started, and um, I moved some of the children uh, out of there, and then the other children got on to the idea of what I was doing. And uh, I think I said this in the book, that one of the worst things I ever saw was the the children would swarm around my car and say, when are you taking me, Miss Battle? When are you taking me? But the actually what broke it was um, was the nursery. Because I went in one morning and I knew nothing about babies. I happened to be the baby of my family and I never had anything to do with young children really. But I knew when they were dying and I just picked up three of those kids and wrapped them in blankets. And they, they wouldn't help me, 
You know, I but had to. The staff wouldn't. The staff wouldn't help me. And the matron, she kept, oh, you can't do that, you can't do that. And I just took one after another and put them on the front seat of my car and drove to the Providence Hospital, which fortunately was only a block from that place. And I carried one baby in and put it on the counter and another and another. And the sister was horrified. She said, you can't do this, you can't admit children. And just then the mother superior came along and she, she said, what on earth are you doing in this battle? And I told her. She looked at the babies and she just went out of the door like a shot. And she pulled three doctors off the floor. It was about 10 o'clock and they were on rounds. And they started interstitials and they saved those kids. But if I'd been a day late, they wouldn't have, mm -hmm. you know. You. And after that happened, um, the Keith, in his usual wonderful way, led a cavalcade into Moose Jaw and took all the kids out that belonged to the department over and left about ten children in that institution. I'm trying to imagine the scene. Well, it was pretty... Uh, imagine this scene. I was standing at the gate and um, I said to Keith, what am I supposed to do? He says, stay here and answer questions. So you were left behind after he took the kids out. Mm -hmm. What did the society board say after that incident? Oh, they were just furious. Of course, uh, the head of the Children's Aid Society in Moose Jaw had been the head of it for about 30 years, and he was a lawyer. And I, sa I said, oh, I'm not going to say this, it shouldn't be public, but um, you're going to cut it out anyway, aren't you? It's going to be edited. Yeah, well, you see, these are things you can't say if it's not going to be edited, but I'll say them to you. That um, a friend of mine in Moose Jaw was a lawyer, and um, I said, well, you know, he's a lawyer. I can't imagine why he's so interested in this, and he isn't the kind of a man you'd think would be, you know. And he said, well, Millie, don't you know that he does all the finalizations of adoptions and putative father agreements and gets paid for them? And I thought, well, what a baby I was. What mm -hmm. a baby. You know. Yeah. I. So the reason for his interest became clear to you? I said, oh, that's not sure, true, Harold. He said, oh, oh, I don't know when you were born. <laughs> So uh, there were a lot of undercurrents here yeah. that it's very difficult to write about. Sure. Moose Jaw paid $18,000, or the city paid the Children's Aid Society $18,000. Well, they weren't going to have to pay anything if the government walked in. So the uh, treasurer, of course, Julian Marquis, who was a lawyer, he was all for getting rid of them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, <laughs> now, gradually, you know, it, it's smoothed out. And I think the other thing that really bothered me about it was that they had no doctor would go into that home. This, this is the shelter that you're speaking of? They had such a loathing for the president, you know, but they just wouldn't go. And the children had scabies and and this kind of thing and they went to school and, uh, it, and they were known as the welfare kids and they had an apple day for the poor kids and the apples were brought to school where the kids were going you it, you get the feeling I'm sure don't you mm -hmm. of what was going on yeah it's, and, it's humiliation for the kids humiliation for the children that's right Right. Have, still sticking to the same time period so that I can get a better an, an understanding of what child welfare was like in that time. And again, this would have been about 1946 or 47, I guess. No, that would be in 45. 45. Mm -hmm. Were kids uh, who were in the care of a children's aid society at that time, were they um, uh, hired out? Uh, was any of that going on at the time? Um, I guess the boys were. 
I, I didn't see that. But, uh, for instance, um, from boys' school, they sent boys out to, uh, on wages and so on. Mm -hmm. And they got wages, but they didn't know they had them. And uh, I had to clean up those trust accounts about 15 years later. <laughs> Yeah, so the employers paid wages for the boys, but... Yes, they the went to the agency. And the agency didn't use the money. They intended to give it to the boys, but they were so busy they forgot. They forgot. Um, what about for the girls going out as uh, domestics? You know, I never heard much about that. Mm -hmm. I don't think it was mm -hmm. as common a practice. There was a bit of it, now that I think about it, but not, uh, not like the boys from the school. Mm -hmm. no. Was... Uh, was the idea of uh, for-profit maternity homes an issue in Saskatchewan at that time, in '45? Was it? An issue? Was it something that was occurring? Do you mean profit? Mm-hmm. Profit maternity homes where you could buy babies? I don't, th I don't think so. Mm -hmm. It certainly was the case in other provinces, and I didn't know whether it had happened here or not. I'm not sure I understand exactly <clears throat> what you mean. People would come and say they wanted to adopt a baby, and the administrator of the, the home would say, well, it costs $500 for a baby. Oh, no. 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 I, I never heard of that here. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you why I don't think it would have happened here, was the two women who worked in our department, you know, Alice Dales, and um, I, I just, well, I, I just never heard of that. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure if it had happened that Keith would have t found that out and he would have said so. Miss no. Dales had been in adoption for, uh, what, a oh. decade before you came back. Oh, years, so. years. Yeah. Um, she went, uh, Keith sent her to the University of BC uh, to take so, uh, a class in social work, and this was the beginning of uh, training for, um, you know, Keith was great to have, have trained staff, and, and so he set this up, like, almost like bursaries, mm -hmm. and uh, the first year he was the director, he became director in July, and in October he sent five people to the University of BC. And Smith, who was out there as the head of the university at the time, everybody knew what a mess Saskatchewan was. You know, it was a blight on the landscape almost. So they were very eager to help him. Mm -hmm. And they took these special people in. And they were all huh, fine, fine people. They didn't happen to have university education, but they had other kinds of education, mm -hmm. believe me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the final question, no, I have two more questions again about that period of time, and then perhaps we could take a break if, if it would be all right. One is the role of the RCMP in child welfare at, in 1945. After 1945? No, in 1945. I suppose they apprehended children prior to that. I never had, I never had that. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't mm -hmm. tell you much about it because I don't think they were that involved. Mm -hmm. You see, even though the department was didn't have trained staff, they did have people throughout this province to administer old age pensions and mother's allowances. And these people, these men, were scattered like at Assiniboia, at Swift Current, mm -hmm. Melford, you know. Mm -hmm. And because old age pensions and mother's allowance was a part of the, was in with um, the Bureau of Child Protection. They were in the Bureau, mm -hmm. actually, of Child Protection. If something happened in Melford, we'll say, um, the social welfare officer, or whatever you want to call him, he handled it. It wouldn't be the Mounted Police who would handle that. Mm -hmm. Do you see how it operated? Mm -hmm. Even then it was sort of uh, decentralized, you know, right. in, a, in, a, in a funny kind of a way. And for instance, the first case that I ever had in Moose Jaw happened to be at a Cinnabon, mm -hmm. a, a court case. 
and of course I didn't know anything, so it didn't matter. But the social welfare officer down there had actually apprehended the children. Yeah. And he has set up the court and that sort of thing. And it just happened that I was there, uh, but it would have gone on whether I was or not, mm -hmm. I think, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. So they carried that role. Uh -huh. um, and the final question that I would have about that period, uh, again, 1945, um, was, uh, would be regarding Native children. It was regarding what? Native children. Were they part of the usual caseload? Um, Look, uh, this is one thing I would like to, uh, to clear, very, make very clear. We didn't have anything to do with Indian children. And that remained true as long as I was director of child welfare. Why was that? Hmm? Why was that? The provincial and federal government simply didn't agree on what, you know, that we would take responsibility for those children. Mm -hmm. um, I had an unmarried mother in Moose Jaw, I think I tell this in the book, an unmarried mother in Moose Jaw who had a baby and she was an Indian and I had to phone Indian Affairs to, to because at that time she had to have her hospitalization and, and medical care paid and they sent a mounted policeman up and got her. To do what with her? Take her back to the reserve. You see, Indians couldn't leave the reserve. This was the reason. We never saw many Indians because it was it was a long time before they could get off the reserves, you know. Um, it would be interesting if you found out that actual date that they were given permission to leave the reserves. Up until then, they had, I call it a one-day pass, you know, they could get permission from the uh, agent to leave for a day or, or so on, but they had to be back. It was like being in prison, kind of. And that's why when that... Uh, Act was changed, the Indian Act, that you got this swell of people into the cities. Hmm. You didn't know that. No, indeed. <clears throat> well, that's, that's what happened. Mm -hmm. And up when I first came, when I first worked, um, we were almost trespassers on the reserve. You know, uh, I wouldn't have gone on one without permission. Mm -hmm. I, had a, I had a fairly good relationship with Indian Affairs, though, as I think about it. But I had to do it because Keith Armstrong wouldn't speak to them. He had been a missionary. He was a, a minister. He'd never know it, but he was. And he had been a missionary in God's Lake. And after he'd been there, he wouldn't even say the word Indian Affairs. Hmm. <laughs> you know, he just wouldn't have anything to do with them. So if anything came up, I had to do it. Okay, is there anything more you'd like to say about that, that period of time, 19, child welfare in Saskatchewan, 1945? Well, uh, this is a very personal thing, I think, but I think it would be true of anybody who worked in the field. Um, and that was that there were not good places to stay. You know, if you were out on the, in the field, the hotels were, well, you soon found out, or found out where there were bed bugs in the hotels, you know, that kind of thing. And there were no decent restaurants. And, uh, and of course, the roads were, were terrible because the only blacktop was between Regina and Moose Jaw. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What was it like to be a woman alone on the road? Um, well, it was fine, except that you, um, you know, that you had those problems of traveling. Mm -hmm. And as I pointed out, I didn't know anything about a car. So it was rather difficult. Actually, people were terribly kind. For instance, I had to go out on, on a uh, request from the Department of uh, National Defense, and uh, they did these the government did these for the federal government. Marie was in charge of one of these things. 
And uh, this man had applied for compassionate leave because his wife was sick. And so I had to go out to see if his wife was sick and report back to the proper things in the army and so on. And this happened to be Moss Bank. So I went to Moss Bank, and my first port, I had two ports of call that I always did when I went to a place. One was the Mount of Police to find out what was going on, because they sure knew. And the other one was the secretary of the municipality, you know. So the two, I always saw these people when I went to town or anyway. So I went to see the Mount of Policeman, and I asked him where this place was. It was up in the hills in Moss Bank. And he said, what do you want to go up there for? I was very, I don't tell people things, you know, I'm a social worker. <laughs> but he guessed. He said, that so-and-so, I bet he's applied for leave. <laughs> and he said, I can tell you right now, his wife's teaching school. You don't have to go up there. Well, of course, you know, I, I had to do this myself. I, <laughs> I couldn't even take a policeman's work, wasn't I, in those days? It's really kind of funny. I would today, you know. <laughs> and um, he said, well, I'll tell you, I'll drive you. I'd rather do that than hunt for you tonight. So he took me up and I went to the school and wrapped the door and sure enough there she was teaching school. <laughs> He was right. He said, I personally took him in when he was called up. He was a you know, conscript. Mm -hmm. But so I would say, and the other thing that was good about what happened to me was that the welfare officer who did that territory and did mother's allowance and social assistance and old age pensions. He had been in that territory a long time, and oh, he was a good man, and he knew, he knew people. And when I would go to a municipality and say I was Miss Battle, you know, the director of child welfare, or the child welfare worker, oh yeah, Harry said he'd be along. <laughs> so it was, uh, you know, the door was kind of open mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. And I won't go into why Harry was such a good friend of mine, but because it was because of a, of what happened the first day I ever went out in the field with him, mm -hmm. and he thought I was from Montreal. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. Should we stop there? Okay. All right. <clears throat> now, How much of this? Right? We finish. Alder. Um, yes. He's on Sebastian. They were both uh, McGill graduates, you know, and both of them sub. Would that be all right? Yes. Okay. Are you, are you ready? Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Audio tapes on. Yeah. Okay. Um, when we broke Miss Battle, we were talking about uh, um, your time in Moose Jaw and child welfare in 1945. Um, you also had some involvement with the uh, Regina Children's Aid Society a little later on. What happened there? Yes, I came to Regina as a supervisor after about 10 months in Moose Jaw. And uh, at first I supervised the older girls, but then later I became the supervisor of protection and unmarried mothers. And was responsible for that work throughout Saskatchewan. And this threw me immediately into the courts where I had a great deal of experience later on. And uh, because I was a supervisor of protection and, and uh, unmarried mothers, when the Children's Aid Society of Regina went out of business, somebody had to do this work. And I, in effect, became a supervisor of the work of protection and unmarried mothers in Regina. How was that different from what you'd been doing in Moose Jaw and, and uh, the other experiences that you'd had? 
Well, it was different in, in many ways. I suppose not different in a way from some of the things that were going on in Musha. But this was just after the war, you know, and it was appalling. The housing situation was simply dreadful. People were living in, you know, one doctor came and said, look, you have to take this baby into care. I've had it in the hospital three times. And it wasn't that the mother was neglecting that baby. It was uh, a different thing altogether. And so you had this dreadful housing situation and all these new people reuniting of families and it it was really something to work in and at that particular time and um, the uh, supervisor of uh, the children looked after the wards and so on and he had to take over uh, all the wards of the agency and uh, Miss Dale of course, continued to do adoption placements and adoption and so on in the city. So that it was quite a business, mm -hmm. you know, really. And we oper so that meant that what you were doing was operating as a provincial supervisor and a city supervisor. And it stayed like that until the regions were formed in 1952. You were doing that in Regina for that long a time? Well, I wasn't doing it that long, but that's the way it was handled for, mm -hmm. you know, because I became the assistant director in 1951, mm -hmm. so, and director in 52, mm -hmm. but that's, that's the way it was until 1952 when the regions were set up. Did that kind of um, division cause problems for the children or for the workers? Well, it happened pretty quickly in, in Regina. Now, when the Children's Aid Society in Saskatoon went out of business, it was a completely different thing because they gave us lots of time and, and uh, Reg Jones um, and Charlie McGall was the regional administrator up there at the time. They conferenced all the cases, you know, and so they knew what they were doing, and he had gone out to the people and explained what was happening and, you know, that kind of thing. So it was a much easier transition. Mm -hmm. We had to be the ones who told the people that we were the children's aid. In, when that happened in Regina. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I almost told Bert that last year when I was having a drink with him in Victoria that he was a so-and-so, <laughs> that he'd Bert done it who? that way. Bert Rowe was the children. <laughs> um, okay, you said that you became assistant director in, what was it, 1951? Uh-huh. You had a chance then to really expand the amount of time I imagine you were spending doing administration. Well, actually, in the main part of my job in as assistant director was to run the children's institutions. Oh. And uh, that was kind of an interesting thing because um, we had an institution of all things at a place called Green Lake, which is miles north, about 70 miles north of Meadow Lake, which at that time was the end of the steel. The end of the steel. Railroads. There was no communication with Green Lake except the CNR telegraph. There was no phone in there. And and they, they, Keith had the, some bright ideas, and one, this was one of his bright ideas, that they were taking a lot of Mayhe children into care, so they would build an institution for Mayhe children right there in where the Mayhe are, you see, and then it would make it easier to move the children out of that institution back into their families. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it didn't work out that way, because what happened was, that the children became a way above their families in what they demanded of life. After all, they'd been in this wonderful institution where they were clean, where they had baths, where they were fed, and they went to school every day. Mm -hmm. you know?
So with an institution that was a long ways from any kind of communication, how, how did you, how were you involved in that as an administrator? Well, I was involved in it because Marie, quite rightly, felt this was the craziest thing she'd ever heard of. And she was, we were going to close it. So I became very involved because I was in on the closing of that institution. And because the civil service in Saskatchewan is unionized, all those people belong to the union that worked in that institution. So I had to see all the people. Um, Alice Dales and Bob got uh, placed the children, but I had to do everything else. And I took some of the children out anyway. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, <laughs> I always remember I was taking one load of children out and at Glassland, which is about halfway between North Battleford and Meadow Lake, I, I went into a cafe and I happened to meet the um, treasurer of the province. <laughs> and he said to me, what are you doing here? And I said, I'm closing Green Lake. And he said, thank God. Oh, uh -huh. uh, Claire, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> now, you see, it's things like this. I went to normal with him. Oh. So, you know, it makes a difference. Sure. It makes things a lot easier, I would imagine. That's right. Um, what were some of the other things that happened during the time you were assistant director? Well, that was the big one. The other thing, of course, that happened was that uh, we were getting ready at that time to decentralize. We knew it was coming. Um, it, it's interesting to look at who was there. Al Johnson was head of the Bureau, and he was the um, deputy treasurer of the province of Saskatchewan. Is this the Al Johnson that later went on to the CDC? This is the Al Johnson. Okay. Yes. And. Um, oh gosh, his name was right on my tip of my tongue. He was the fellow who was in charge of um, wage and price control. Tommy Shoyama? No, not Tommy. Mm -hmm. um, Levine? He was here, of course. Cass Beggs? David Tansley. Tansley. John Tansley. Tan oh, yes, yes. And he was in the Budget Bureau, too. Mm -hmm. And they, uh, it had been decided that, uh, by the Budget Bureau, actually, that what we needed was a new administration in that department. It was all being handled centrally, you see, from a center point out to, yeah. And that was okay. When we started out, we were just a tiny little agency we got to be a big agency. Mm -hmm. Yeah, by that time you had 600 employees or so, I understand. Yes, yes. Yeah. So that it, it was going to be decentralized. Mm -hmm. And Al Johnson and Don Tansley interviewed the people in child welfare. Um, and Tansley always laughed because we had one person then who was very forthright, and she said exactly what she thought, <laughs> and he he laughed about that. But the whole plan of decentralization uh, came along, and it is in the book on the chapter on administration. I talk about what happened at that time, mm -hmm. and it was a very difficult period. It could have been a very difficult period. But this is where Marie showed up, really, uh, her strengths. Um, she was the person who saw to it that staff knew what was going on. And for instance, we held a weekend seminar when everything was explained to all of the supervisors in Saskatchewan and, and, and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. and, we had to sit down and decide 
of things like what is the responsibility of the region what is the responsibility of central office? Mm -hmm. And we wrote it down. In gr you in groups? Marie and I and John Crane, mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. who is now a, a professor at the University of BC. And as somebody said, I never could understand John, John and I can't let you. Yeah, he, he was a terrific brain. and. Uh, he is their statistician, uh -huh. that kind of a fellow. An awfully nice guy, but should never have been in direct service. Mm -hmm. So that those things all had to be done, and Marie saw that they were. Mm -hmm. And so then... Can I ask you a question about that <clears throat> before you move on to something else? Um, from my reading of of uh, your description of that change in your book, Children Shall Be First, it looked to me as though people in administration were removed two or three more levels from the deputy. It looked to me as though you became further from the centers of power. Is that what happened? I would say that I, we went one step. Mm -hmm. All right, it looked to me like it was two or three, but did that one step make a difference as far as what well, you were able to me. get done? It sure didn't to me because I'd known Jack quite too long. And he was the deputy? Oh, yeah. You see, Jack White, who later worked for the Canadian Welfare Council when he resigned from, from there, um, He had been the Commissioner of Old Age Pensions, mm -hmm. which was in the Bureau of Child Protection and Old Age Pensions. Prior to that, Jack had, during the Depression, been responsible for making sure that all the cattle and, and so on in Saskatchewan uh, weren't, uh, didn't die, all the livestock. And he was in charge of a section called Feed and Fodder, you know, to make sure that... that so he was embroiled in the, uh, you know... And the director of, who later became director of public assistance, had been the man who ran the work trains, who took the people out of this province and put them in camps in Ontario where mm -hmm. they were. So these men had a real background of what it meant to to su see people suffer. Mm. You know, they had lived through it. And for that reason, I think, you had no trouble with social work principles with these men that mm -hmm. you work with, mm -hmm. you know? The other thing that, that was different about Saskatchewan was that you had a CCF government for years and years and years and years. That's right. Who probably appointed some of these people, I guess? Pardon? They appointed Jack White and, and some of the Well, other. Jack was the first deputy minister. And it was interesting. I asked O.W. Velo why, who was the first minister, who we all called Oak. Um, I asked him why he'd appointed Jack White. Mm -hmm because I always felt Jack was a wonderful deputy minister, you know, but... Uh, and he said, well, you know, when I was in the opposition in the House, he is one of the very few civil servants who wouldn't give in to me because I was a member. <laughs> and that's yeah. the kind of a guy I wanted for deputy. Right, right. Okay. Um. You were further in a way from Jack White, yes, he was further from staff. Uh, further, though, from the staff in the field, which I felt was, he tried, he, he went out and visited the regions and so on, but it mm -hmm. isn't the same. Mm -hmm. It isn't the same. The department had grown, though, and I imagine that. Oh! They had the number of, um, how had the 
membership in the professional association uh, developed over those years from 1945 to 1952? Well, we had quite a, uh, quite a large um, uh, SASW, actually. Um, Bill Burke was here, and uh, Bill, do you happen to know him? Yeah. He's on the staff of the uh, at Toronto, the school uh, staff, Dr. Bill Burke. And uh, he was a card, and um, he was the president at one time, and oh, there'd be, there'd be 65 or 70 people sitting there, and everybody mad for some reason. You'd get arguing about different things. I said to Bill, wasn't that fun, kind of, you know? And here for a long, long time, SASW was. Now, mind you, it isn't any longer. I've just got their last uh, list of members, and it seems to me a lot of people that I have thought were out of the fold are back in. Mm -hmm. I think they're cuddling together for strength mm -hmm. in the face of what's going on here. Yeah, yeah. Were you at all involved in the SASW during those years? I was days? secretary for about five years, mm -hmm. and I was board member. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you find that as an effective way to try and get social change, uh, social progress? No, no. I, at least I never saw it happening that way. Mm -hmm. How did change come about in those days? How did things get better? I mean, through what processes did things get better? Huh. Well, every every department had to write, um, you know, if you were in charge of a program, you had to write um, work programs, we called them work programs, which outlined uh, first uh, the purpose of the program, the history of the program, what had gone on, and then what should be going on and what you want it to have happen. Mm -hmm. this. These went first to the Budget Bureau and then they went to Cabinet mm -hmm. to make those decisions. For instance, one that I, I always wanted to have come in and I put it in the budget four times was an advisory council for child welfare made up of citizens from here, there, and the other place. Well, this was just too revolutionary at that time. But imagine the way that people are involved now. Eh? But it was, I was ahead of my time. Mm -hmm. That was, uh, but uh, that's the one I remember that they turned down all the time. <laughs> it wasn't the money. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't have cost that much. But uh, it was the, I don't think they wanted people to be nosing around. Mm -hmm. They were good enough themselves after all. Mm -hmm. even, even with the CCF government. Okay. So are you saying then that social progress was came about through um, the civil service process of doing things? I, I think that was the focus of it. It came from, in a way it came from uh, the the grassroots, because we were working with the grassroots. Mm -hmm. You know, like you were out in the field, you knew. And people, for instance, in the town of Assiniboy would tell you, well, this is something that has to be looked at. or uh, So that it, it, it sounds terribly centralized and everything, but actually it did come really from the field, mm -hmm. you know, because they were the ones who were in touch and they you know, through meetings and this kind of thing, we sure got the picture. Mm -hmm. For instance, I remember one um, regional administrator, and I was making up budget, I was working on the budget, and he was in North Battleford. And he was going to, he had enough staff given to him that he was going to open the district north up to Meadow Lake. And he phoned and said, a budget for 72 extra children in North Battleford region. I'm going to apprehend that many. <laughs> you see, he knew. He knew what was up there. Mm 
Yeah. So it was no surprise to him yeah. that when he did go in, he'd have to apprehend these kids. Yeah. And it wasn't approximately 70, it was 72. 72. He yes. had the families and everything right. like that. Right. Over the years, did that change the, the, the way from 40 well, to... I can't. Oh, that's okay. We can just put it right back on. No problem. It might be best if you didn't tie knots. Play knot. with it, though. Well, you can play with it, but if, but if you don't tie knots... Isn't this a dreadful thing? But I think it depended a lot on personalities. When the regions were set up, the director of regional services had been a former supervisor in our department. He knew us, he trusted us, um, and so on. So that, but this is a, if you read that administration chapter, you'll see it's quite a little uh, tightrope you walk on here. Maybe you could, for the people who haven't read the book or won't be able to, maybe you could describe that tightrope. Well, tight you see, the branch was responsible for the level of practice, and they were responsible for the new ideas and and to put them into motion and, and that kind of thing. But it was ter terribly difficult to do in a way because you had the director of regional service there who was responsible for practice. Now the point was, how did I find out how somebody at North Battleford was working? Mm -hmm. He could have blocked me from going to North Battleford to find out. Mm -hmm. You know, now he didn't, and that went on for. It wasn't a problem until you got somebody who was fairly new to the department, who didn't trust me as far as he could see me. Then I think that things became difficult, and so, and I say this in the in my write-up administration. This was something that had to be addressed because it was a real problem. And this was true particularly for new people. Um, yes. I noted in the notes that I had read from some other uh, material that uh, w the department had grown to about 600 by the mid-50s and you had a turnover rate of about 30 percent. You had a lot of new people to deal with often. Oh, sure you did. Yeah. As long as you kept the old core, you were, you were fine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You see, or even when somebody like Bob Talbot came in, you were fine, because as director, you know, of welfare, Bob had had a lot of experience, and anyway, he's that kind of a man. Mm -hmm. The difficulty would be, and was, I, I maybe shouldn't say this, but it was, if you got a person who was wanting power in any job, beyond what their own uh, job entailed, then you were in trouble. Mm -hmm. You were in trouble with this setup. And I don't think it could have gone on much longer, that they, you know, without it being more clearly defined. Mm -hmm. Because I was responsible to the deputy minister for child welfare. Now, <clears throat> If I couldn't go out and see what kind of practice was going on, how could I be responsible to the deputy minister? This was the problem, really. So it really depended a great deal on personalities, as you can imagine. So part of the way that you would do your job then, as director of child welfare, is you, you would go out and see what was going on. You wouldn't just oh, sit sure. in a vagina. But uh, the other thing is, uh, I guess one of the reasons it worked fairly well was that most of the people who were in the regions had grown up with me in the department. Mm -hmm. You know, they were old staff who, when I say old, I don't mean in age, but they had been with us. They knew us. They knew me. They knew Art Savon and mm -hmm. so on. Mm -hmm. So that they had no compunction about asking for help when they needed it, for instance. They didn't have to prove that they knew everything. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you understand what I mean about mm -hmm. this, don't you? Mm -hmm. And they asked for help 
when they felt they needed it. And they had, so because of this, I had a fair amount of uh, contact with them. Mm -hmm. Because they would call me about all kinds of things. I always remember the regional administrator at Prince Albert who phoned me one morning and said, Millie, are you sitting down? And I said, yes. And he said, are you sitting firmly on your chair? And I said, yes. And he said, well, I'll tell you the worst thing that's ever happened in child welfare. And he did. One of our staff had been uh, fined in court for uh, refusing to talk. Never happened in this wide world. For refusing to talk about a child welfare case? Yeah, she was in contempt of court. Mm -hmm. What did you do? Well, the judge fined her $150. Did the department do anything? Well, what could you do? She was wrong. She shouldn't have been there. She shouldn't have been in the court. And anyway, she'd only worked for us for two months and she didn't know what to do, the poor child. Mm -hmm. But the big problem that that regional administrator was faced with is how do you pay a $150 fine? Sure. Yeah. yeah. I guess I was hearkening back to the experience that you told us about early on where you went to get the girl out of jail. <laughs> you know, I'm thinking back to, to Montreal times. No. We didn't get her out of, uh, she was fined in that court. Yeah. And uh, we had to pay the fine. Uh, we had a dreadful time finding the money to pay the fine. And Jack White said that I would have to put it through on an order in council. And I said, I will not tell the whole cabinet that we were idiots, you know. <laughs> I found some yeah. money. You found the $150 for Yes, the I did. Uh, again, continuing on this line of discussion about administration, you had mentioned earlier that uh, the social work staff uh, in your department had been unionized early on. How did that affect your duties as administrator? Well, when they when they were unionized, you see, I I um, I wasn't an administrator. Um, it didn't affect us at all, except that during those years it was extremely helpful. How so? Because, for instance, when I closed Green Lake, I told the union, I am going to close Green Lake. And I told them what I had found out about the staff, and they sent somebody up to Green Lake, and they went over it with them, and what I said and what they said to him were exactly the same. So what happened was that the union representative, you know, the fellow at the union, sat down with me, and we figured out who had bumping rights and where they could bump to, maybe, or who didn't and uh, who wanted, didn't want to move out of the north, and, and so on. So we closed the institution, and there was no, no kickback at all. Now, when we closed the baby's nursery, we did the same thing. But the union helped. You know, this, I saw them in the role of a help to me because I didn't know anything about the union business. Rather, and they were the kind of people who, who were like that. They wanted a good civil service. Bill Leonard retired from his job as the executive director of the union. And with a year, within a year, they were on strike here. Hmm. And this was only because of a change of executive directors or whatever they called. So again, the personality factor. Oh, yes, that. yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. So in my experience, you see, I always saw the union as a partner, if I can put it that way. Would you see them as well as partners um, in, in practice, in social work practice and standards? No, we didn't, we didn't go that far. <laughs> no. What, what effect do you think the unionization had on standards of practice and quality of service? I don't think it had any. I can't, I can't see where the union affected practice. Um, 
The only time that I felt the union uh, could take a stand was on salaries. And um, I had to go out and take over the Yorkton office once. And, oh, they were all yattering out there to me about the low salary social workers got. And, and a social worker I knew was married to a man who was an ag rep. And we were going home one night, and, and she was really annoyed because her husband got so much more money than she did. And he was a, she was a social worker. And he looked down at her and he said, well, I don't know, Jen, why you should be cons surprised about this. Don't you know cattle are more important than people? Oh. Now, you know he just said that. But because he thought it was crazy, <laughs> you know, the whole thing was crazy. Yeah. But So when I was out at Yorkton, I said to them at a staff meeting once when they were gathering, I said, look, I can't do anything about your salaries. None of us can. There's only one person who can do anything about the salaries, and it's you. You are members of the union. Now, why don't you exert some pressure? You are the people who have to raise the ruckus, not us. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the staff went to every office and got signatures on his own time, on the weekend. Mm. On weekends. Mm -hmm. Ron Willie, his name was. He left the profession, incidentally. Mm -hmm. And uh, they took their work to the union and the union listened to them and they got quite a good increase in salary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? But that's the, I think that it was hard, I think it was hard for social workers to reconcile the fact they belonged to union. Kind of, yeah. Mm -hmm. They were free spirits. Yeah, one of the things that I've heard um, uh, when, as I've talked to other people uh, for this project, is that when they first went into social work practice, they would work 12 hours a day, if that's what's required, and then drive home on their own time after that. Um, I think that it's not that way as much anymore as it used to. Oh, be. no. No, I'm sure it isn't. They're earning about, um, I'd hate to think, 20 times as much money. <laughs> and, uh, not doing a quarter of the work that we had to do. Mm -hmm. But you see, I, I think there's a little difference. We were pioneers, you know, in this game here in Saskatchewan. And we had to make it work. Didn't matter how long we worked. We had to make this thing work. And I don't think that they have that feeling at all as a matter of fact, I'm quite shocked by the number of people who are retiring ahead of time simply because they can't stand to work in the office. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's bad, isn't it? So, d because they're demoralized, you think, or tired? Yeah. Or? No, they're demoralized. Mm -hmm. But they don't agree with what's going on, and this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I didn't agree either, and I just got out. That was the difference. <laughs> um, you were director of child welfare during what period of time? From 1952 till I left in 65. Um, I think I have those uh, right. Can you describe the changes that happened over those years in child welfare? I, I don't think there were great changes because it had been pretty well set by 1952, policies and so on. What did change, I think, was A, we expanded into areas of the province we hadn't worked in. You know, you there was no point in going into the north, for instance, uh, although one man did go into the north. Um, but unless you had backup staff, because it would be appalling to you what you would see, what you did see. 
But as those areas were opened up, and you see the whole thing of roads and all, this changed the picture of, to a more immediate kind of situation. There was an immediacy about things, which could have been there for two weeks and nobody would have ever known the difference, you know, before. I mentioned this in the book. The mm -hmm. changes that were in in this. So this was inclined to change practice, I think, in a way, hopefully, for the better. You know, they saw kids oftener. They were able to plan for children better. Mm -hmm. And somebody wasn't lost down the sink, you know. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I, I think those were the changes that took mm -hmm. place. And what about for you? Uh, you moved into a se very senior position in the department. Um, I'm thinking back to what you told me about when you first went into the uh, the Department of Munitions and Supply in Ottawa and how disorganized they were and what a mess it was. I heard your administrative analysis coming through there. Again, thinking over this 20 or 30 year period, 25 year period perhaps, how was it for you as an administrator? You'd had no administrative training. How did you know what you were doing? <laughs> well, I, I do think that in a way, this is where some experience came in. You remember I said I had worked four years for the provincial government in the tax branch? Now there was administration. I saw it work. I saw how the chief clerk, for instance, came around, every once in a while he would come in and he would say, well, how are things going today, you know? And I thought, well, isn't he just a nice fellow? I found out years later that this is part of personnel, that you keep in touch with staff and you get to know them and they trust you and they will come to you then with your their problems and so on. This is a very important part of administration, eh? Well, I learned that in the tax commission. Mm -hmm. And I suppose from teaching school, where you worked with boards and this kind of thing. But some of the other things just seem such literal common sense, you know. I, but I do think this is where age comes in a wee bit. You can apply anything you know, new, or picked up in. Uh, What appalled me in that office was that the, the, they were getting four new people for the summer to take over part of the load. And I said to the man who was the boss, well, what are they going to do? And he said, well, you, you take charge of them and tell them. I didn't know what I was doing. So. <laughs> <laughs> this had been when you were back with the department in the provincial government. Pardon? When you, this had been before the war, when you were in the provincial government? No, this was when I was in the federal government during oh, the war. Yes. He didn't know a thing. No. Um, during the time that you were director, did, did, um, did the clients change the type of child that was coming to your attention? The attention yes. Department? Yes. It began to change. In the early days, it was very physical. You know, the kids' needs. For instance, you'd have children that were covered with sores, um, who had lice in their heads, and and all this kind of thing. And and much of the um, neglect was based on that kind of uh, lack of physical care of children. If you read read the records, you saw this. As the province grew up and you had health centers of, in all these districts and so on, that the health of children wasn't the problem that it had been. And then you began to get into the era of children who were neglected because of emotional things which was much more difficult to prove in a court, you know. It's mm -hmm. harder to prove that. 
um, this is the change. This is the change that you were certainly aware of. Um, because that physical thing was gone. Uh, you know, the schools and so on, they were more aware of it and so on. For instance, I taught school for six, six years and only saw, once saw a public health nurse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there, weren't, there weren't as many. Pardon? There weren't as many in the, in the early days. That's right. Um, a very specific question that I'd like to ask you um, is about the, um, the amount of child abuse that you saw in the early years and then later. Were you seeing child abuse uh, when you were a school teacher, for example, and then in the 40s? If, I, the if, if I was a school, I, I taught school in a very civilized territory. You know, I didn't teach school out in the boondocks. I taught school out in the wealthiest farming district in Saskatchewan, mm -hmm. just out here on the Sioux line. Mm -hmm. uh, so that I didn't, when I taught, I didn't see what I would call child abuse. Um, in the first school I taught, the the rule then was anybody outside the three mile limit didn't have to come to school. And there were some children outside that school limit in the rural school I taught in who weren't coming to school mm -hmm. and had never been to school. The secretary treasurer asked if I he could get them to come to school, would I teach them? And I said, of course I would. And they walked three and a half miles to school, and they were very, very bright children. They, they progressed from nothing to grade four inside of a matter of months, you know. Uh, they were very bright. They were very poor, too. I don't know what they lived on. But, you see, I, I lived in, I was brought up in a district that was very well organized and so on out of Bushjaw. And everybody went to school. It was ridiculous not to go to school. No. So that when I first got a, a request from the Army, uh, through the Army, you know, to go and see a family because this boy who was in England in the Canadian Army was worried about his brother who had, wasn't going to school. Mm -hmm. I thought, this is ridiculous. So I went out to see him. And it was true, he was 12 years old and he'd never been to school. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I was just as shocked as... <laughs> I'd never heard of such a thing happening. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what had happened was that in the bringing together of regions, you know, the schools became no longer the little red schoolhouse out there, but the schools became regionalized. Mm -hmm. And the school to which he would have gone was at the edge of the region, and in order to go to the central school, he would have had to go seven miles, and there was nobody else around him, so that he would have been alone, or, and somebody would have had to drive him seven miles every day. Mm -hmm. And they just didn't bother doing that mm -hmm. little thing. Yeah. So as an old school teacher, this was kind of appalling to me, you know. And uh, I went to see the superintendent of schools, and he mm -hmm. said, "Well, you know, if we did that, if the board, if we insisted they do that, those men in that district would be very angry that we're on the board." having to spend all that money, you know. Mm -hmm. I couldn't believe my ears because I was used to an inspector who came to see me and said, Millie, will you take this boy? If you don't, he won't get educated. Mm -hmm. You know, this is the difference. A whole different aspect, yeah. And um, 
So I went to this old inspector that I knew, and I said, Mac, what would you do if you were good? He said, I would tell that inspector that if you, he didn't do something, you'd, you'd have your deputy write to his deputy. Kid went to school. <laughs> But, you know, it's this sort of thing. Yeah. I need to interrupt you. You can leave things running, but Ella, I want to ask you if you do something for me. Right, sure. Let's see. Do, <clears throat> if you, would you tape that thing up? <clears throat> I noticed that the microphone is falling. It oh. needs to be just horizontal. Okay. Yeah. So. Oh, yes. <laughs> we don't want to lose our sound. Um, but so, I, these were the differences I saw, you know. See, the reason I asked that question about child abuse was not child abuse in the 30s and 40s. Very rarely did a worker see child abuse, physical abuse. And I'm, I'm trying to check that out. With well, I would think that's quite true. I'm sure that somebody would have reported it to us. But we did see the other thing that everybody talks about, and that's incest. But again, referring to my book, I said, I think we saw the tip of the iceberg. We saw the terrible cases, just dreadful. Mm -hmm. um, staff said I could smell incest. <laughs> you know, you, you know. Something about a relationship or an interaction between a parent and child that would. Sort well, of for instance, a girl came to our our office and she had uh, she was pregnant and and when you asked her about the putative father, she said it was a. She didn't know the man. He wore a tam, and he was. She met him on the road or something, you know. Mm -hmm. So she didn't know who the father was. That same girl came back in two years and told the worker the same story. And I said to the worker, "Don't you talk to her one more bit." And I called the mount of police. Mm -hmm. And when the mount of policeman interrogated her, he the whole thing came up. And in that family, there was mother, son abuse, uh, incest. There was father, daughter incest. There was the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And the children, gee, when we took them into care, they were so up. They're disturbed youngsters. You know? mm -hmm. Well, why wouldn't they be? Mm -hmm. But when I say we saw the tip of the iceberg, I think that we did. We saw the dreadful situations. Mm -hmm. You know, like the man who shot his wife and then turned around and shot himself. This was incest. Um, and I always felt that it was much more prevalent than, than we had any idea of. Mm -hmm. And it's coming out now, isn't it? We're certainly hearing a lot more about it. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. But oh. child abuse, you know, uh, I keep thinking there's more Maybe there's not any more abuse now than there used to be. But as so many more things are now, they're, they're on open, you know. You could have hidden child abuse when there were no roads, uh, no public health people um, who would say there wasn't abuse. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody could prove that one. Mm -hmm. It would be tough because Canada changed from a rural society to an urban society in about 25 years and all the time, as you say, it was a rural society, there was so little communication, so little interaction compared to now. Oh, yes. And, you know, now we walk down the street and see maybe two or three hundred people every day. In those days before, you might go a week without seeing someone you didn't, you know, someone new. I think that you would have found it more in rural Saskatchewan, probably, uh, the uh, that sort of thing. And when I say rural, I mean the, the small towns and so on. I have a faint recollection of a family in, in uh, the town where I went to school. And my mother, I think, was uh, an early women's lib. She went out for the vote, you know, and that kind of thing in 1918. And she was simply furious because this man in town beat his wife. 
And I applause to be Beatus' children too. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it it would seem to be, but nobody was worried about the kids. They were just worried. <laughs> My father was just worried about her. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, the other question that I want to ask you about that period of time that you were director of child welfare was the issue of religion something that you had uh, oh, that came to your attention? The the Roman Catholic Protestant. It was terrible. The Mennonites, the other religious groups that are in. No, the only ones that bothered us were the Roman Catholics and the Protestants. What happened? What was the what was the problem? Well, the reason it was a problem was that the Child Welfare Act said that you could pl you had to place a Catholic child in a Catholic family and a Protestant child in a Protestant family. Now, as it turned out, we had a great many Catholics, half our population. Now, this was not a picture of the population of Saskatchewan. You know, half the population of Saskatchewan wasn't Catholic. But half of your child welfare population yes. was. Now, the reason for this was the half of those kids that came into care were Métis. And as one of the staff said to me, you know, she was a Catholic too, she said, they just went along and flipped some water on their heads and that made them a Catholic and they never looked at them again. But when it came up in court, they were Catholics. Mm -hmm. And so the, the judge had to find religion and he had to find residence, which is the other bugaboo. And that child then had to be placed in a home of his religion. Now, the people who wrote the act didn't know anything about, uh, about other religions, obviously. And they didn't know that there were people who were fairly nice people who didn't have any religion. <laughs> but. When I left Child Welfare in 61, that was still there. Mm -hmm. They took it out in the new act. Mm -hmm. But oh, you know, I went to see the bishop and I had these figures and I showed them to him. It was a difficulty to find Roman Catholic foster homes, was it? Oh, yes. Yeah, almost impossible sometimes. And, and so you place children in Protestant homes, which is against the law, but you had to with usually the consent of the priest in the district because he did, couldn't find any place for that kid either, mm -hmm. you know. So, mm -hmm. but, uh, oh, there were, there were many Roman Catholic priests who, who thought that was wrong. Mm -hmm. They felt that, and I've forgotten the name of the bishop in Winnipeg who was the leader of the anti-religion kind of thing and said, it doesn't matter what religion a child is, as long as it has a good home. Yeah. Following through on that, did um, during the time you were child welfare, were kids ever adopted or placed out of province or out of the country? We never placed children out of the country because TDC Douglas wouldn't have let you. Tom, Tommy Douglas, he would, he would, he would have known what you were doing. Well, of course, the minister would have known, so he would have known. Mm -hmm. He was very much opposed to this. He felt that we should keep our children. What did you think about that? I think some of the placements that were made um, I, are, were questioned. I would have questioned them. But I would have questioned them on the basis that I didn't trust agencies in the United States. I knew them too well. I had met with the directors of the, for instance, the central region and this kind of thing. And, and their standards were so much inferior to ours that mm -hmm. I wouldn't have done. Of course, there were some agencies, I'm not denying there were agencies in the United States that uh, had marvelous practice and standards and so on. But I've often thought the Head of the head of the uh, Child Welfare League it must have had his eyes opened when he moved from Toronto. <laughs> Ed Watson. Yeah. Yes, yes, I'm sure. Um, you mentioned a minute ago the issue of residency. How was that an issue for child welfare during those years? Residency requirements. 
oh well residence was uh, was quite a dreadful thing I felt because if a uh, if people came to this province who who neglected their children, we would have had to send them home. If they hadn't hadn't obtained residence here, which meant living a year without help. Um, a year in the municipality or a year in the in the province? Uh, a year in the province. Did because there was such a thing as provincial residence here. If a person hadn't established residence somewhere else, hadn't lived, for instance, in Regina long enough to establish residence here, and in the meantime had moved to Moose Jaw, then they would have been a provincial responsibility. Okay. They'd have been in the province a year. Did a child's family I'm, I'm, let me see if I can figure out how to phrase this question. Again, relating to residency, um, for child welfare, did, did a child have to be on the social assistance caseload before he could benefit from child welfare services? Oh, no, no, no. But the residency requirement repl applied not only to child welfare, but also to social assistance. Actually, you know, this is the most ridiculous thing that ever happened. But they withdrew residents from, from uh, social aid before they did in child welfare. They kept it in child welfare. And the minister couldn't get the cabinet to, to pass that, you know. Do you know why? They felt that if they took away that residence qualification, that the people in the municipality wouldn't care what happened to their kids. Now this is a big lie, you know, but you couldn't get them to explain it. But a case, I, I say this in the book, that when you had to prove a point, really, a case landed on your desk. That was just it. And that's what happened. A case landed on my desk which just was the perfect one to show what dreadful things could happen if you carried that out. And the minister took it to cabinet and they did away with residents and child welfare. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that I think, I think this is another thing that, that was interesting to me was that there are times when you, uh, what is that verse? Uh, Taken at the flood leads on to fortune. Well, there were times when if you jumped at the right time, it, it worked. <laughs> Other times you were, for instance, the same thing happened to me with boys' school when I was in charge of boys' school. It was dreadful. They didn't have classrooms there. And this is a long story. It goes back to Hugh Christie, who built this monster out here. So, and they had to build a new school because it was burned down. You know. But they they only gave them a wee wee bit of money to build the school. So it was perfect, absolutely inadequate. At which point I took over the and I thought, isn't that dreadful? Again, being an old school teacher, they were sitting with their noses practically against a wall. And they they had to move the chairs back and have their school in the dormitory. Mm -hmm. And I thought this was dreadful, was simply dreadful. But no, the minister tried and it was T.J. Bentley and if anybody could get anybody to do anything it was T.J. Bentley. He was the minister when Medicare came in incidentally. Mm -hmm. And he couldn't. So he finally decided he'd ask the Treasury Board to go to visit the school. And the Treasury Board was made up of the Premier, not Tommy Douglas, Woodrow Lloyd, the Treasurer, who was Clarence Fines, and Walker, who didn't matter. He, you know, he was just. So these fellows came out to the school and we went around that place with them. And Woodrow Lloyd and Fines 
were both school teachers. And after we had done this, I said, I was standing beside him, and I said to Clarence Fines, how would you like to teach school here? And he just glared at me and said, hmm, no. But we got the money. Mm -hmm. That's the way things happen. Well, you, you know, you have to be patient, let's put it that way. You have to be patient. The deputy minister, Jack White, said that when he was running uh, an institution for senior citizens out at Wolseley, I think about it, that he wanted an elevator put in, and he put it in the budget eight times before they passed it. <laughs> Takes a while. Miss um, Battle, why did you leave um, the department? Well, I have never talked about this, you know. But I, I left the department because I didn't believe in what they were doing. That's why I left. And I really and truly, and I don't think you, I'd want to broadcast this, am I, I'm on the air too, mm -hmm. is that I no longer could depend on the fact that if I said, okay, something is going to happen, that it would happen. Your authority had been undermined in some way. Well, it could have been changed around, you know, or, yeah, I no longer could say that. So that I could no longer defend staff, you know? And, and they had always, <coughs> over the years, I had been able to get them out of the worst messes that they, you could imagine, and always had been able to stand behind the staff. I couldn't any longer. And I guess this was really the reason I quit. I, mm -hmm. couldn't, I couldn't bear it mm -hmm. to have them look at me and say, you can't do it, Millie? What's wrong with you? I couldn't do that. Mm -hmm. What had happened to... Uh, Would you have been able to? I've never been in a senior administrative position. No. No. Well, I couldn't. Mm -hmm. And rather than see the thing disintegrate in front of my eyes, which it did, I preferred to leave and not watch that fiasco. Mm -hmm. It what was too painful. To, uh, what, had, what had happened to, to ch the ch a change in atmosphere or government or public opinion? Um, no, it was a change in government. And the funny thing about that whole thing was it was really the minister that they put in, who was And um, I had made up my mind before I resigned I was going to see the premier of this province, whom I knew. So I went out to see Ross and um, he said, well, I don't know why you're leaving, Millie. This is crazy. And I said, I'm not the person that's crazy around here. Believe me, I'm not. And he said, well, if you wait for three or four months, something might change. Well, three or four months, they got, he got rid of that man. There's no question about that. He did. But I wasn't going to wait and watch it. And it didn't matter. It fell apart anyway. Uh, uh, another reason it fell apart was that Jack White left. Mm -hmm. Jack couldn't stand it either, mm -hmm. and he'd been the deputy minister for well, 1942. Mm -hmm. So, were with this change in government, you mentioned the effect on you and on your staff. Could you see an effect on the kids? Of course. In what way would that kind of thing show itself at, at the client level, at the front line level? I think that the thing that really bothered me was that staff were afraid to make bad decisions. When I say bad, I mean difficult decisions. Mm -hmm. They were afraid to. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. They'd never been afraid before. Mm -hmm. You know. Were they afraid they were going to get fired or something? Pardon? Were they afraid they were going to get fired? Well, they could. Yeah, sure. But you see, we had always been able to be the line of defense before that, mm -hmm. and I couldn't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the, the child who would be the focus of a decision would be left in limbo, I would assume. I don't know what happened to him. I'm not yeah. prepared to say. Yeah. But it's a sort of thing that in Ontario, you know, when I, I have a friend who lives in Toronto who, who sends me clippings all the time that make me practically weep, you know, of a worker who was a judge said that you must give this child close supervision. Well, does that mean you live with them and the child died and who got blamed? The worker. Nobody blamed that judge. I would have blamed the judge. Why? And I would, well, if I had had that decision handed to me and knew the situation and obviously it was a bad one, I would have taken him to appeal. Mm -hmm. But they've never heard of appeal in Ontario. You know, this is a, this was the other strength that I, that we had, I think. I, I knew all the law society. <laughs> Mm -hmm. The members of the Law Society, and I, I really did, and uh, they, were, except for a couple who were shysters, you know, you could depend on them. I knew the secretary of the Law Society, and uh, I, I think these kind of contacts were terribly important, and after I left, you see, there was nobody to do that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It was so split up, and the department was all muddled up. We are gonna a, there is no director of child welfare, you know that. No. Well, there isn't. Mm -hmm. The responsibility is split. And there hasn't been for a number of years. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. But that's the reason I left, and mm -hmm. I I have never published that, and I prefer it not to be published. I mm -hmm. just simply left, mm -hmm. and uh, the radio and TV and everything. Was, I just wouldn't talk to them. Mm -hmm. the, one of the reasons I wouldn't talk to them, I had the beautiful example of Ruby McKay out at the coast, who, as you know, has gone into oblivion. Uh, literally, she. She might as well be in a convent, the way she, outside of Gwent, the way she lives. And I phoned her, and Ruby and I were through a lot of times together, and I phoned her when I went to Victoria, and she never invited me over or anything, mm -hmm. you know. She had gone public with a child with a concern about child welfare in 1960. Yes, right? and she felt so betrayed because people didn't uh, back her up. Yeah. The staff of the department. Yeah. Now why would they? Why would a Jimmy Sadler uh, go to bat? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. you just uh, people just don't do those things, and I would never have expected staff to do it here.